it's Chris. Let's do this. So crowdfunding roundup this week, a little bit of everything, a smaller smattering, but I'll have you know tomorrow's video talking about the last week in August, as well as the one coming up the following week, the first week of September. I'll tell you right now, both of those weeks, uh, you might want to watch your budget because there are not massive games, but a lot of seriously high contender games that you just need to be aware of. And so that's what we're going to be sort of looking at and talking about. But there's a couple of interesting campaigns of note this week. So let's get into it. As always, thanks for watching. Let's do this. So first up, this is going to be a little bit of a departure, but I can't not talk about it because I'm also backing it out of curiosity more than anything else. And this is Project Ironside. I covered this a couple weeks ago or a month or two ago, even on the upcoming crowdfunding video, but it never launched and they got delayed. And now here it is. This is a $400 board game table that's expandable. And how do you feel about that? There's 2,500 people backing already. It's, it's already raised almost $2 million in the first 48 hours, which is relatively impressive. Now they say that their factory, whatever they're doing from a manufacturing side of things, if you go down here to the pledge levels, that they can do 400 a month starting in, I think they said July, 2023. So you're effectively looking at about six months worth of production right here. So if you're just going to it now, you're potentially not going to get it until the end of 2023. But this is by far and away the most affordable board game table that we've seen out there, right? Easily, easily, easily. It's just the question of, as they say with a lot of products, you also potentially, and I'm not saying this is, you know, either way, you pay for what you get. And that's sort of the conundrum, the dilemma with this one is, is it actually going to be $400 table or is it actually going to be well above its punching price? If you understand what I'm saying there. I am a big fan of the minimalist style because I will say a lot of the other tables out there, you know, the two, $3,000 tables, I don't need all the fancy woodwork. I don't need all the fanciness. I need a game table that plays games, period not something that is the most aesthetically pleasing that's going to match the furniture around it, you know? The other question that has to be said with this is, as I mentioned, as it says in the pledge levels here, 400 sets per month, can it actually do that? What if they start doing this and they get to 200 sets a month? Then you're looking at, you know, a year later than the projected date, right? Not just a year from now, but potentially you'd be talking two years from now. And if you don't care about a table, uh, you don't have a need for a table, this is fine. But if you have need for a table, two years of waiting, are you going to be at the same home? Are you going to have the same size restrictions, size requirements, uh, needs from that aspect? That's the big question. And that's why ultimately I'm probably going to cancel this is because I really don't know what two years is going to look like from now if that's what I'm actually going to get. Uh, I can't say how it compares to the other table play areas, but I would say it's probably slightly larger than the table I'm sitting at right now, which is what's needed. You're needing at least, I think I'm sitting at about a three and a half by three and a half uh, square table. And this is bigger than that. This is a three by five. So it's minimalistic in the size too. My kitchen table is probably more like a four by eight. So that's what you need to think about. How modular and extendable do you need? Because it does do up to three by seven if you want. Or if you're really feeling adventurous, you can do two of them and make a three by 10. They have a bunch of accoutrements or add-ons down here, just like all the other table campaigns. But I like the fact that it's not as deep either as some of the other ones I feel like because you got that ledge and if you're someone like me who has a bad shoulder, like I can't afford to always have my arm propped up because it sort of gives my shoulder an issue. So if it's not as deep and I don't have to have my arms as up as high in that sense, I'm actually preferring that because it also feels like sometimes, as they mentioned here, you're a little farther away. You have a tabletop component to transform it into an actual table, steel coating around the outside, neoprene playing surface. That's a tongue twister if you uh, say it fast. Three different colors. So, I mean, this is what you get. Here's all the accessories, right? The, the stuff that I mentioned, plus a little bit of all the other stuff that you usually see with uh, these sort of campaigns, which I'm guessing if you get half of this stuff, it's probably gonna double the price of the table itself but you're still going to be less than a lot of the other tables out there. So take it for what you will. I'd say give it a look-see. But the real question I'd say for me is, if you don't get this for another year and a half to two years, is that okay with you? 
Also, what is the shipping going to be looking like on this? I have no idea. I didn't actually look at that at all. I'm going to skip all over the add-ons here, so you don't have to worry about those. You can check those out yourself. Here are the individual prices, though. I mean, again, some of these prices are 50, 60, 70 bucks. Uh, connector pack to, to get the two of them together is another 130. So, yeah, I mean, you could easily be at $1,000 before this. Uh, shipping, though. Let's see. Shipping. I'm going to be zone one. So, shipping's another 160 bucks. That's not insignificant for a $400 price point. Yes, I'm under $600 or so without any add-ons, but again, two years of waiting, potentially. Potentially. I'm saying I'm an under promise over deliver. So that's why I say it that way. It's worth talking about though. So check it out. Next up, Sea of Legends, Vengeance of the Empires. Now this is an expansion. My question was, and I wasn't clear last week, was whether or not this was going to be a standalone or if this is going to be an add-on expansion. This is an add-on expansion, Vengeance of the Empire. 200% of its funding goal is already raised, 1,200 people backing it. This is an app-driven pirate narrative, uh, sort of a campaign-ish game, if you will, where you're trying to get 10 notoriety to win the game. And you're also, this is the other aspect that's different, going up against AI-driven factions that have specific goals that they're trying to achieve in the meantime while you're going for your notoriety, which is your victory points, if you will. You're basically doing one of three different actions on your turn. You're going to a port, Ports have various actions at them that you're going to be able to use to upgrade your crews, upgrade your ships, manipulate resources, do things like that. The second thing you're going to be doing is using the app to go on a quote unquote adventure. Most of those adventures are going to be dealing with either your captain's story arc because you have an asymmetric captain with abilities that you're going to be utilizing that's going to have a personalized campaign. You're also going to be having a nemesis as well as a lover. And so you have options to advance their storylines as well. So so you have three options within that second different action. The third different action is you're issuing a challenge, a battle, uh, uh, going up against an NPC, going up against a rival faction, maybe going up against release the Kraken if you want to. They're offering a price reduction for this campaign from what they say it's going to be at a retail and they're offering a free upgrade kit for those of you that supported it the first time, which actually is really nice. A free upgrade kit. All you have to do is pay shipping and they'll add it to the, uh, if you get it at a higher pledge level, they'll just add it for free to that pledge level. And so you just get it along with that. The rule book is relatively intuitive. It gives you a good rundown of these different actions. Like I mentioned, the port actions, uh, refreshing your crew, taking the port actions, including tavern, hiring hall, shipyards and hideouts hideouts burying gold uh it's a little strange right you have to acquire the gold but burying the gold is what gets you the notoriety which is the victory point the faction turn you're going to be going up against the factions like i mentioned basically npc ai teams and so that is what you're going to be trying to stop trying to mitigate trying to achieve your victory before them because they are also checking for victory every round as well. There are several different factions in the game as a whole that they talk about down here, and it runs through the different captains you can see, and then the various lovers and nemeses, and then here are the factions that you're going up against, right? The Spanish Armada, the Atlanteans, and I think of pirates and Atlantis, right? <laughs> anyway, the British Empire, the children of Tilak, and then you also have the Dread Tide. So a, a smattering of variety. And this plays, again, one to four. So you can be choosing how many of those or it's giving you some variability in terms of the ones you're going up against. Now we get down to the expansion because, I mean, this is a reprint, but it's also mainly about the expansion. What is the expansion bringing? Well, it's bringing four new captains. So doubling the number of captains that you have at your disposal. And it's almost doubling the number of factions here. The Spanish Empire, Cursed Souls, French Empire, and the Writhing Maw, whatever that is. I'm assuming that looks like the Kraken from the picture above. So that's really going to be the additional thing that you need to know there. So it's kind of it's kind of cool though because when you scroll down they give you a little bit of what the description of the captains are without going into too much uh spoilers of what their abilities are and then they actually give you the faction breakdowns and so i like this it's not just the faction is trying to achieve uh 10 victory points like you are right each of these factions uh has a different asymmetric win condition so if this attracts the mutineers attention the doomed sailors overrun too many ports the cursed souls win the game if you go down here to the Kraken, if the Kraken causes too much destruction, it wins the game. So it's going to be affecting different aspects of different parts of your actions, your abilities, and your situations that you're going to run into in order to achieve its victory. So you're going to have to mitigate things along the way, potentially teaming up with your opponents to try and make sure that you just don't lose to the game itself. 
The other expansion here as well, Rise of the Ancients, I believe this is the first one, offering five different factions as well and another four captains. So again, different asymmetric abilities, win conditions, everything like that. The real question that you have to ask yourself is, with this narrative campaign uh, situation, are you okay with the app usage? It's $100 just to get in, and each expansion here is going to cost you 75 bucks. So that's the issue. Are you willing to spend that much money? Do you like these app-driven campaign games? And it's a bit divisive nowadays with our current tabletop scene. Some people really love it. Some people absolutely hate it. A lot of us are just like, okay, case by case basis. So that's what you've got going on here. Premium add-ons here with additional miniatures, mats, a few stretch goals as well. So that's pretty much everything you need to know about Sea of Legends with the new expansion, Vengeance of the Empires. Is more a better thing? That's what you got to ask yourself with this one at the price point. Take it for what you will. There you go. Next up, the comic book bubble. This is a relatively straightforward family style, uh, lighter-ish. I don't want to say resource management. It's not really auctioning. It's not even really bidding, but it's manipulation of economies, if you will. And the basic gist of it is you have these comic book covers that you start out with, and you have two of them, and you have three different ways of playing these cards, or three different actions, essentially. You can buy, so meaning you're going to pay whatever the cost is, so three times whatever this genre is along the market, and we'll scroll down to see what the market is. The second action is you can speculate, you can use the ability down here at the bottom of the card, and the third action is that you can sell, and you can sell the card for whatever the price is of the genre marker over over here on the board. And so depending on which one you choose, it also gives you the ability to manipulate the markers of the prices of said genres in the first place along this board right here. Obviously, buy low, sell high, trying to maximize profits, I believe over, now it says four years, and I'm not sure if that's exactly four rounds or something more than that, but that's essentially all you're doing in a 45 minute one to five player game, right? It runs through what I just said right here in terms of the asymmetric powers, the speculation action, which is the manipulation of said markers in the first place, and then rinsing and repeating, buying and selling. So that's pretty much the game in a nutshell. Ape Gamers putting out, um, it seems like a relatively solid product. I'm just not sure why people aren't necessarily hitting it as much. And that's always the question in these situations. So that's comic book bubble. It's light. But I wouldn't discount it, especially if you're into the speculative uh, economy style of game that you might be able to play with, say, your kids. That's what this gives me the vibe of. This is not the comic book Golden Age game that's coming out in the next month on crowdfunding as well. And that's because that's more of a worker placement. That's a whole nother conversation. There you go. Comic book bubble. Next up, Space Lion. This is also actually a relaunch. And if this looks familiar, it's because it launched previously on GameFound earlier in the year and it failed to fund, which is another interesting test of the market. We've seen GameFound have several of these smaller projects that really, again, I, I hate saying this, but GameFound does a really poor job of the distribution of the game page, right? When I go over to GameFound here, and we'll talk about Robomon actually next, one of the three that's highlighted at the very top of the page is one that's not even launched. It's a preview. It's their own preview, so I understand it. But then you go down to the next three, and of these top six, two are live projects. That's it. And part of it is you just don't have a ton of projects. Part of it is you're not actually showcasing the other ones that are active down here. Up at the top, Amygdala. When I'm filming this, Amygdala actually has one day left. It's only 80% funded right now, and it's down way here, right? Uh, same thing with Pandemonium Estate. It's got $11,000 pledge, one day left. Intergalactic Ace. I don't even know what Intergalactic Ace is. I must have missed that one when it um, launched. But it's got 12 days left, and it's being featured down here, right? Why are these not up here? Why don't you have all the active ones at top? Like, that's where you want to get your money. The people who are going to know about Tainted Grail don't need to be reminded of Tainted Grail. The people who are knowing about Kingdom Come Deliverance or Keyforge know about it. They don't need to be necessarily as front and center. You want to get more of the other games because... Otherwise, what we're seeing is these ones that have trouble are now jumping ship. The ones that wanted to do GameFound in the first place are coming over here. That's a side tangent as a whole thing. GameFound, again, is a whole other side tangent as a whole as well. Another video or two or three. But this is Spaceline. What do you need to know about Spaceline and why should you consider backing it? at this two to five player. And the thing I don't like to see is this Kickstarter exclusive solo mode. And the solo mode is only available in the deluxe edition. So take that for what you will. It is a $29 game at the base retail pledge level. And it's about 60% funded right now. 
It's a faction sort of uh, between two castles-esque battling tower lane game, if that makes sense. And I'll explain a little bit further so I'm not totally uh, just throwing out random terms for you, right? And you have seven cards that you're going to be choosing from. And you have five different armies. And you have five different armies right here that you are asymmetric factions uh, choosing one of them to begin the game you have cards that are zero to six and what you do is you take turns deploying them between the different battlefields so if you're playing two player there are three battle lanes in between you and the other player and you're choosing which one if you're playing multiplayer you actually battle both the person on your left the person on your right as well as potentially a center battle if you have say four people now if it's three people again it would be the same thing you'd have a left and a right and a center there as well and so you're potentially managing multiple lanes here and what you're trying to do is you're trying to have the most strength when these cards are revealed, but you play them face down as you see right here. Now, as the turns end, then you play them face up and everyone reveals. But you can also just play them first face up to utilize a different ability that they may offer you. Now, when I mentioned that you have values of cards zero to six, you have a leader, an asymmetric leader um, of these uh, armies, essentially. That's called, the, that's the space lion, right? Uh, the space line takes the place of one of those cards, I believe, right here, and you have one of seven different lines that you have the ability to choose from in terms of abilities, strength, and everything else in between, because these abilities are going to manipulate the battlefield that is present in front of you in the first place. And they give a little bit of a different overview of what the different asymmetric factions are. Okay, you have your well-balanced, you have the trickies, you have the root persistent uh, tree faction, if that makes sense. Uh, again, an, a unique hidden agenda one, and then this one just being a very powerful decree special ability faction so they're going across the board in terms of you know variety in that sense it's a beautiful game to look at you can check out the full rule book but that's basically the nuance of things that i've mentioned here uh special abilities a few tokens here and there the kickstarter exclusive deluxe edition has deluxe components as well as the solo mode that i mentioned down here and you're getting a little bit of art and then an insert as well I don't know. I don't feel strongly about the deluxe version. And I mean, I want to see this game produced. I think it'd be an interesting test, but I also have trouble with this is, is it going to be as balanced at a three or four player count? Uh, are certain factions really, you know, this is the game that needs to have complete asymmetric balance because if one or two of the factions are just better than, or more targeted towards another faction and you're playing a four player game and you happen to end up next to the person who has a better faction than you, as opposed to the person that's across from you, it's going to be a little bit harder to deal with. And, and that's why these games are so tricky is because balancing five factions like this is incredibly difficult. That's usually why you don't see a lot of stretch goals that add in new gameplay content as well, which is a blessing curse to get people either to back it or that people are saying, why should I get it now, right? Because if I, you're not a solo person and you don't care about deluxifications, there's not a necessarily a big enticement apart from, I want to back an indie game and get it funded and get it made. So how do you balance that? And which one of those do you do? And which one of those you don't? And that's, again, something that people go back and forth on all the time, but I like to talk about because it's an interesting topic and we should be supporting people that we like in the first place, so. But that's Space Lion. It's going. It's doing a lot better than it did already on the first time on GameFound. So uh, take that for what you will, GameFound versus Kickstarter, as well as um, that effect. So there you go. Let's hop over to GameFound now. GameFound, Robomon the Tabletop Adventure. I had the video out uh, earlier in the week for Robomon. It's actually, this is one of those campaigns that I have no clue when I'm looking at this. I go, people are either going to really love this or it's also going to fall flat on its face. And I just never know nowadays with some of these games, right? There's some games that you look at and you go, this is going to kill it. And there's other games you look at and you go, this one's not going to do well. And there's other ones that I just go, I have no idea what the market audience is going to look at this and see. And this is basically as close to Pokemon, the board game in a tabletop setting for one to two players. I would argue it's probably ideal for one player the best, but this is emulating a little bit of the video game with a smattering of the uh, tactical-based combat that is going to be more reminiscent of, say, the show, if you will. Because the problem with the video game is that you just stand there and you press a button and you do an attack and there's no movement, there's no back and forth, there's no learning necessarily the weird abilities that you may want. And this has a little bit more tactical-driven nature. It's very open world. This is probably one of the most open world that I've played of the uh, open world uh, campaign story-esque games on Kickstarter crowdfunding in the last, you know, probably two years that this has been the rage. 
please check out my video if you're interested at all in this. I give a full breakdown of what you need to know. You have a map book, you have an encounter adventure book, and you're going back and forth between one and the other, choosing, you're flipping open to battle pages, you have some narrative, you have some adventures, you have some quests, you have trainer battling, you have wild battling, you're going to be using dice that you can mitigate that are going to be very tactical in nature as you're moving around the map. You are catching these Robomon via the use of programmers or reprogrammers, you know, because they're robots, you know, you wouldn't use a Pokeball. And so you're getting to do that on the battlefield with manipulation of a spatial element that some people are going to like and some people are not going to like, and that's okay. But it's sort of more open-ended. You can kind of just go anywhere, do anything you want. It doesn't handcuff you necessarily like the video game does, right? Like if we've played the video game, you know, I have to do gym one and then I got to do this gym and then I got to do this gym. You know, there's a power creep. Each gym is progressively stronger. I mean, you're doing certifications. You're trying to achieve certain quests. You're trying to get points and achievements in that sense to get these certifications, not necessarily badges. So there's not necessarily the, I have to be a certain level my robomon have to be a certain strength in order to fight and win this no i mean you can do that the battle system the wild battle system is actually relatively unique i give them a lot of kudos for that but again it's dice dependent so you need to be aware of that and i just kind of like how the system of the robomon attacking of using attacks is going to potentially exhaust them so you have to choose how why and to what strength you want to use the attack and save up potentially if even if you have the attack that you want to use if you don't have enough dice to make the stronger attack well it may cost you the same energy whether you do one die worth of damage or three dice worth of damage so maybe it's not the most optimal time to go so uh two player mode now it says here you can uh, take an adventure you can see some of the solo mode so i wasn't privy to that so take that for what you will i really looked at this as a solo game but if you can get enough control as a second person as well it makes it a little bit more appealing from a two-player standpoint but i would still argue i would probably look at this as a solo game you know player's game if you will if that makes any sense the rules are there the rules are good the rules are good i didn't have any trouble with it from that aspect uh, let's see, $79 is going to get you the uh, additional content like additional Robomon. I think they said, I think Gabe said that there were going to be something like 60 uh, Robomon in the base game, including evolutions and things like that. There's my generic quote. Um, and I, I, I mean that, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be very judicious with my quotes nowadays because I've critiqued a lot of other people. And so I'm trying to be very true to what I feel like. So my video is down here at the bottom if you really want to check it out. Uh, there's an expansion as well. I didn't realize that. It looks like the expansion is basically another big adventure book and map book. So uh, the only question would be how much more are you getting? Uh, tokens, cards. Is it going to be just more wild Robomon? Is it going to be more ones you can capture? I'm assuming, judging by this card right here. Just how much extra is it? I'd like to see a little more information on the page. Hopefully there's some down here. When we scroll down to the expansion here, let's see. Not really. Okay, I'd like to see a little bit more from that aspect. That would be nice. Uh, and I'm sure maybe with the updates, they'll have that out. Some stretch goals here that you're getting extra content, it looks like, for. And uh, the extra content, I think, would be a lot easier with something like this than Space Lions because you're just getting more variety. So I'm presently happily surprised that this one is killing it. It's 150% funded, and it's just going to go up from there. So it's got three weeks left. Robomon, check it out. Tail Story, reverse deck building game. I talked about this one as well in the upcoming video last week. And you're asking yourself, how do I do a reverse deck building game, right? Well, what you do is you're basically trying to just play through your whole deck and the cards that you have of one of three different animal factions, they're giving you the ability in different ways to manipulate the deck, either taking cards off the top of your deck and putting them straight in your discard pile, taking cards off the top of your deck and putting them on top of other people's decks, or just allowing you to draw extra into your hand to go through your deck in the first place. And that's the basic gist of each of these three different factions that you need to know because they each manipulate it in a different way. Now, the thing I like and the thing that they go over here right at the top, let me see if I can find it right here, the character transformations, because essentially what you're trying to do is you're trying to go through your deck four times. And if you go through your deck four times, then you get to lay a card down each time declaring, you know, sort of keeping track. And so each time that you lay one down, though, you get a different uh, sort of, I don't want to say ability, but different condition that allows you to manipulate things slightly differently. This first one, you have an altered form. So you start off with an asymmetric ability, and this asymmetric ability then, after you lay your first one down, gets better. And this is the catch-up mechanic that I kind of like. If, if you get the second one, 
everybody gets their altered form no matter where they're at so it's preventing potentially a runaway leader problem at the same time the third one is doing the same thing your hand limit now the amount of cards that you can hold in your hand in order to manipulate and draw from to get to the discard pile is now less so it keeps things balanced and the fourth one well you just win like i mentioned that's the basic gist of it. All the cards have special abilities. I mean, you have a bunch of different basic actions here that they're running through. Uh, drawing being the most forward one. Stealing. Burying. Burying is putting cards down. Stopping. Bribing other... It's, there's some take that across the board. So you're going to have to deal with take that in this game. And they run through sort of the different bonuses that the factions have that I already talked about. Altered ability. How the you know flipping of the abilities from one side to the other is going to change the game. Uh, Two-player playthrough. And also the rulebook. So it's relatively straightforward. It's just a little bit different, and it's kind of an odd combination of asymmetric take that reverse deck building. If all those things sound good, I highly recommend you check it out, but it's definitely a niche within a niche, and I think that's why it's you know struggling a little bit, even though $2,800 for a game that a lot of people probably have never heard of is doing pretty good. $24 for the standard, $39 for the holographic, which uh, both are going to get you the stretch goals as well. So that is Tail Story. Check it out. Next up, we're going to be talking about Bakufu. I'm, I'm mispronouncing that probably. Japanese-themed strategic card game. Uh, this is one of those small indie ones. It's got 25 people backing it. It's at $1,400 right now. What do you need to know about this? It's a two to four player light card game uh, set in an era of the Shogun where you are trying to either get three war or peace victory points via card play. You're going to be going through the five action phases of this game in order to achieve those war points or peace victory points that you need in the end to win of three. And so what you're going to be doing in the first part of your turn is you're going to have the ability to buy cards drawn from a central deck and you're going to be producing resources in order to buy them in the first place. You'll notice that all of these cards have different colored backgrounds because they are different aspects of how they're going to help you or potentially even hinder your opponent. Blue, for example, you're adding to your castle for your defenses. Red is going to be how you attack and get the war victory points. Yellow are going to be unique characters that are gonna have asymmetric abilities that are gonna manipulate either your cards or your opponent's cards. And then you can also buy these silver cards, which are the peace victory points or how you're obtaining those. They say they've been developing it the last 12 months. It's UK ready. They need a minimum production of so many in terms of the funding goal to actually get the production going. And it's going to be potentially to you by the end of the year because the game is done. They just need to print and ship. So it's an interesting style. I wish they had a rule book on the page. They've got a five minute how to play video right here as well if you want to check it out. And the early bird is essentially all less than $20. So, and you might even be able to catch one of these early birds. There's three left here, but even the full price is only going to cost you $23. So take that for what you will. Check it out if you're interested. Bakufu, Japanese strategic card game. So then we have Campus Wahala. This is an African themed game with an African designer. And so it's a almost at a third of the way funded. Let's talk about what it is. It's a drafting sort of Mancala-esque style game. And I'm gonna just run you through it really briefly. The basic gist is you have this big deck of cards and you create three piles out of it. On your turn, you're grabbing five cards from these piles. There are books in the piles and there are asymmetric characters with abilities that you can use to manipulate how you're going to play these cards. So when you have these cards, essentially what you're doing is you have a certain number of lockers, so based on the number of players. And so you start with yourself and you put a card in your own locker and then you go around Mancala style until you're out of cards. But the character cards are going to change how you can manipulate where you're putting those books in the first place. When you get to five books in your locker, you collect them, score them, and then discard the characters that were next to it, rinse and repeat until you've exhausted all the cards or you go four times around the game. That's it. Now, I wish they had a little bit more of what these cards individually did. The how to play video down here gives you a little bit more information. I wish there was a rule book on here as well. But if you're interested in this, a truly indie game coming out of Africa, I definitely give it a look-see. And if a Mancala style drafting game is of appealing to you, that's Campus Wahala. That's it. That's the roundup this week. I know, like I said, no, no big fireworks, but between the tables, Sea of Legends and Robomon, you know, we still have some pretty significant contenders and all said and done there, I would say Robomon is gonna break 100,000 before things end. So three things that are gonna be easily in the six digits and one of them that's gonna be in the sevens, 
that's still that's a, still a pretty decent week. Now, if you want to know what I was talking about uh, for next week's videos and what's coming out on the 29th, 30th, uh, tune in for tomorrow's video because I'm going to go over them all, my thoughts and everything else in between. So, and maybe we'll throw in some campaign updates as well from that standpoint. So, that's all I got. As always, stay classy. See you around. Thanks for watching.